everyone to um, our workshop today. We're super excited that you're joining us. Um, this is a series on sales and building your business. And Nabil and I will be talking today about sales and sales metrics. This is a really great part of the series. So we hope you enjoy and glean a lot of information. Remember, this is recorded and you will receive a copy of the slides at the end of this session. So if you've got questions, post them in the Q&A and then you will be able to receive again the copy via recording as well as the slides. So um, first and foremost, if you don't know who we are, we are um, a portion of the SBA. SCORE is a nationwide nonprofit organization. We have over 300 chapters, over 11,000 volunteers that bring forth business education services to our local communities. So if you are in need of any of these things, if you're starting a business, researching and planning, if you're opening a business, if you are in the growth phase or getting ready to exit your business, we do have an exit strategy team and we are here to help you. This is free and it's personalized. You can get a personal mentor. You can go to our website at minnesotascore.org and get that information. And you can sign up there to get a mentor and get some help. So in addition to these workshops, we do offer the mentoring as well. We also want to thank our community partners. Um, again, part of the SBA, without them, we wouldn't be here, but our community partners also provide much needed funding for us to continue to provide educational workshops as well as mentoring. So thank you to them and their continued support. A um, little bit about me and a little bit about Nabil here. Um, Nabil has a great array of experience. Um, he's worked for several large companies as well as small. He has been amazing at really getting businesses to understand the math behind decision-making and really understanding metrics in terms of making more quantitative decisions. So I'm really happy to be working with him and providing you with this information today. I think it's going to be super helpful. Uh, my background, I've spent the last 25 years helping folks from an educational capacity all the way from startups to mid-stage businesses as well as exiting businesses. And I've been a consultant for a long time. I love what I do with SCORE. This is an amazing organization. And you'll find all of our volunteers have this same real passion for helping people. So we're here to help. We're here to provide you with some good information. And then if you've got follow-up questions, again, we have that mentoring service that will really help you one-on-one. -on -one. So let's get started. We're going to talk a little bit today about the customer journey. And then Nabil's going to dive into some metrics that can really help in guiding decision making. And I think that's a huge piece to this entire webinar is giving you some, some real tools quantitatively to help guide your decision making process when it comes to the customer journey and spending your money wisely. So first and foremost, the business model canvas, if you haven't seen this before, this is our Bible with SCORE. Um, if you are new to starting your own business, this is a resource that we use with every business that we work with. And it really helps you in determining some key pieces to your business, whether you're in startup phase or mid-stage, it really helps you with that. So today we're going to be focusing more on the right-hand side of the business model canvas. Um, with understanding your customers, first and foremost, you need to understand your unique selling proposition. As well, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about customer segmentation and how to really understand where your customers are coming from. So this is a sales and marketing webinar. We're gonna be spending time over here on that right side so that you can develop a further understanding as to how to help you in filling out the business model canvas. Um, first and foremost, when you're looking at, at growth, um, we want to make a distinction for you between linear growth and exponential growth, which is more scaling your business. Um, and Nabil, I wanted you to talk a little bit about this graphic, if you wouldn't mind, because I think that it really goes into some of the, the quantitative aspect that you're going to be talking about a little bit with respect to the metrics. Thank you, Paula. Excellent intro. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, most small businesses, they tend to grow linearly. They depend on uh, word of mouth, uh, customer referrals, uh, 
potentially some minor advertising that typically leads to either linear growth and at some point to stagnation. If small businesses are interested in ex exponential growth, there needs to be a process put in place in order to promote that. It's not gonna happen by accident. And this is what this workshop is about. We're talking about how to put that process in place, how to track it, how to monitor it, how to measure it, and how to optimize that process in order to enable you, if you want, to achieve exponential growth. And as we talk about the customer journey, Nabil, I, I love this slide. I, I think it's one of the best graphics that we have in terms of understanding how to move a customer from awareness over to advocacy, which is obviously the optimal place where we want all of our customers is in that advocacy role. Do you want to walk us through this slide a little bit? Sure. So, so typically the journey of the customer starts with awareness, awareness about your value proposition. And this is when we mentioned initially in the business model canvas, the USP, which is the unique selling proposition. What, what every company needs to have is a unique and compelling value proposition, or as we call it at SCORE, USP, unique selling proposition. Once you have that, you gotta make your clients or your prospective clients aware of that value that you're providing. And there are many ways you could do that. And that slides present the different methods to walk a potential customer from awareness through public relations, radio, TV ads, online advertising, then to the area where they are, you are trying to create interest and desire. And that's the part where consideration is, where you could use, again, social media and social media ads, email for further nurturing, um, getting people to see the reviews on your website, create a blog, uh, contribute to media articles, do direct mail pieces. Then you want them to, to take the action of purchasing your product or service. And you could do that through promoting your product and services via your website or via a store. You could have a Shopify website or any kind of online store as well. And then once you've acquired the client, obviously you want to retain that client. And you do that by further nurturing the client, by creating community, by answering their questions creating a loyalty program, having a client newsletter that you send out on a regular basis, writing additional blogs that will meet the needs of those clients. And then last but not least, obviously you want those clients to promote you to pass the word around to others. So that's the, the advocacy stage. And in this case, you could accelerate that with your social media postings and engagements as well as word of mouth. The thing I love about this workshop, Nabil, is, you know, this slide gives so much information, but as we move through the workshop, you're really going to develop an understanding of where to spend your money along the spectrum and how to spend your money to build each of these segments. So let's move into a little bit more of the lead nurturing and conversion. And, and, and I love this aspect too. You want to explain this slide to folks? So as you create your leads and you want to walk these leads obviously through process in order to take them through that client journey. Uh, as you create these leads, what you have to do is classify these leads so that you could work with the most active or the hottest leads that you, you need to work with in order to convert them to clients. Uh, here, when you create the leads, you want to categorize them and you, you can do it in many ways, but what we recommend is that you create a category which we call low priority and then a suspect. So if somebody, for instance, subscribes to your newsletter or attends one of your webinars, that is most likely a low priority lead. If somebody emails you or calls you and asks for a quote or wants more information about your product, that's most likely a suspect. Suspect because you don't know whether there is real interest or not. So what you want to do is create criteria to evaluate that suspect. And those criteria depend on the product or service that you're selling. So potentially, when do they want to buy? Whether they have a budget? What are the requirements of uh, the product or the services that they're trying to purchase? Those would be the criteria that you have to set. And if certain criteria are met, then that suspect lead becomes a prospect, which means this is a potential prospective client for you. And then you have to walk your prospects through that sales process to convert into an account. And that's typically when you identify additional criteria such as having a budget and then converting them to a client and then retaining that client. And throughout that entire sales process, you're gonna have some of these leads drop out. 
Now, you don't want to, these leads that drop out to be lost, you want to capture them, you want to keep them in your database, you want to keep them in your customer relationship management system. So if a prospect, for instance, has no immediate needs, that becomes a low priority again. If an account gets cold feet, maybe that becomes a prospect again, or again, a low priority. And same thing, if a client becomes inactive, they're not sending you any additional business, you wanna keep track of that client so you can re-engage them and reactivate them. And often as well, your existing clients end up going and buying products from your competition potential, so you lose that client you want to try to maintain a relationship with clients that you've lost as well. So you need really two different processes. One that is the sales process that's on the left side. And the other one is on the lead nurturing process. So you're constantly in front of your clients and you're constantly reminding them of your uh, services and the value proposition, that unique and compelling value proposition that you're offering. I like that this is a, it's, it's a living, breathing system. And, and it really points out to folks, you know, don't let those folks that are in the nurturing process fall by the wayside because they can move right over to that left-hand side into the sales process if you continue to nurture them. So that's a really important piece there. So we look at some sales and marketing tools here. I mean, obviously we've got a lot of tools that folks can use, Nabil, to help them through, the, through this metrics. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and by any means, I mean, I don't expect everybody to be an expert in all these tools, but these are definitely tools that have been proven, been around for a while. Uh, they're proven to work. So we highly recommend that you consider using some of them throughout the uh, customer journey. Obviously, many of you are using, they have web, you have website, you're potentially using WordPress or Shopify or others. Uh, look into all the available technology and try to optimize the technology or the infrastructure that, that is behind your website so that you could maximize the potential of you delivering that message to your prospective clients. Uh, E-commerce, uh, this is something that uh, over the past year and a half, many small businesses uh, clamored to get going if, if, they, were, uh, if they had um, a brick and mortar kind of shop and that shop closed due to the pandemic. Uh, everybody kind of awakened to the value and benefit of having a, a separate channel that is a digital channel in order to enable you to continue to, to work. WooCommerce is used quite often with uh, WordPress. Uh, Shopify is used quite often. Many companies smell through th sell through third parties like Amazon, eBay, Etsy. So um, a lot of technology available to sell online. There, there are a lot of tools that you could use to keep track of your metrics. If you can't measure, you cannot improve. That's the principle that I like to follow. So it's important that you have access, for instance, to all these tools that enable you to track and measure your web activity and your, your financial activities and all that, such as Google Analytics, Search Console. Uh, you could use, um, purchase, you could purchase certain tools like SEMrush, RFs, or Moz. There's a lot of tools, uh, Paul. Uh, social media, for instance, I know many of you use it uh, and it's hard to manage all these different social media tools. So you could uh, subscribe to tools like Hootsuite, Buffer or Social Pilot in order to help you post and track all the metrics on your social media platforms. Uh, yeah, know, I think that the, the piece is, I just wanna stop you right there for a minute, Nabil, because I think that you know, we offer workshops on the, the search engine marketing and um, social media marketing, and we go into a lot of these things more in detail. So if you haven't been to one of our workshops there, definitely check that out because we really dive deep into those. Yes, last uh, month, uh, we, we've given quite a few sessions on, um, on digital marketing, uh, which was very appropriate here. Email, email marketing, that's probably uh, one of the uh, mostly used because it is uh, virtually free. I mean, it's if you have an email database, sending out emails is uh, very inexpensive and you could use some tools to help you through that process. Everybody should be taking advantage of uh, email tools and, and email nurturing, creating drip campaigns in order to nurture existing leads and create more relationships maybe upsell or, or site sell to existing customers. Um, we, we talked, Paula, as well about online advertising. Uh, Jeremy gave a couple of sessions on using Facebook Ad Manager. And um, 
these are obviously uh, very practical for small businesses to use because you could target very specific audience uh, quite effectively on social media by identifying the demographic and the psychographic of um, the target audience that uh, they're trying to reach. CRM, uh, that's what we talked about in the previous slide. I mean, that's an essential tool if you're thinking about scaling your business and growing it exponentially. If you don't have a CRM, there is no way you could keep track of all the leads that you're trying to generate and follow through on them. And uh, when I ask a small business owner if they're using CRM, if their answer is no, I could tell you um, the number of clients that they have is pretty small. The ones that do use CRM tells me that uh, they're very aggressive and interested in scaling their business and growing it exponentially. So it's definitely something that you got to look into if you're looking at uh, significantly growing your uh, customer base. A lot of additional tools in terms of customer experience. Uh, you could survey your clients uh, to get uh, their feedback, keep uh, your fingers on their pulse to see how well they're doing, how, how well you're doing. Uh, look at Facebook Insight. Zendesk is for ticket tracking and uh, getting feedback, potential bug reports, enhancement requests if you're offering any kind of a technology a software product. And um, as you know, Paula, also we've all become very comfortable and familiar with video conferencing over the past year and a half. It saved us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zoom has become kind of a, a common word right now. Everybody is Zooming. Um, I, I have a feeling everybody's Zooming out right now too. <laughs> they're, they're kind of getting <laughs> tired of all these Zoom sessions. Uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, in-person face-to-face workshops starting at SCORE soon. But these are tools that you could use very effectively to communicate with your clients if they're outside of your immediate reach. And um, all businesses nowadays, I think, have awakened uh, to their benefits. And then last but not least, I just wanted to mention this quickly. Uh, cybersecurity is very important. If you're going to be using all these digital solutions, particularly if you're going to be access, accessing them online, like through the cloud, just pay attention to uh, the security of your apps, of your uh, database. You don't want any of your uh, internal employees or external people to access sensitive data. Uh, so make sure that you take the necessary measures to install antivirus software, uh, anti-malware software. Make sure that you're doing backup on a regular basis. Make sure that you're Website is secured through an SSL uh, secure socket layer that turns your website into an HTTPS instead of just HTTP. And then try to use VPN virtual private networks as well um, and, and other tools that could uh, help secure your data and secure your uh, uh, intellectual property as well. You know, this never becomes a problem until it becomes a problem. And then you won't ever have that problem again because you'll actually take this step in cybersecurity but uh, definitely encourage folks to take the time when you're starting your business and building your business to make sure you have that in place. And also, you know, that CRM piece, you're going to find as we progress through this and Nabil starts talking about these sales and marketing metrics, there's no way you're going to be able to, to do this without a CRM system because it really is going to help you in understanding how to manage this and how to spend your money. So let's talk about this a little bit more. The key point that I mentioned here, uh, Paula, is that digital channels have a key advantage over traditional channels, and that is that they are in bits and bytes, which enable everybody to store them, to analyze them, to uh, streamline them if needed, but most importantly, measure them and keep track of all, all these metrics, turn them, turn them into key performance indicators. And that's what we're going to be talking about um, for the rest of uh, this presentation are uh, what are the metrics that you could keep track of in order to measure and improve the processes that you put in place. So this slide that you see in front of you here talks about having a scalable engine of growth. And this is a very essential part of building the growth that we talked about. If you don't have a scalable, and I want to underline scalable here, engine of growth, it's very hard to, to grow the, the business using the same channels that you have in place. And in the previous weeks, we've talked extensively about some of these channels. We talked about organic, which is the SEO uh, route that Jeremy presented to us. Uh, obviously, you could do pay, pay advertising as well through search engines on Google and Bing. 
We talked about social media, how to leverage social media channels and advertise so you could use Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter in order to create a channel so you could sell your products and services through it. And we also talked about retargeting your leads and your existing clients through advertising and through email nurturing. All these are digital channels that you keep track of uh, to a, a very deep level and extract as much data as you need in order to create the metrics that are gonna be the foundation of your key performance indicators. So let's talk about customer acquisition costs as we jump into some of these metrics, Nabil. Yes, and the first one, and I think uh, that's the foundation of any kind of marketing uh, strategy that you're gonna put in place, and that is understanding what your customer acquisition cost is. If, if you do understand that, then you, you, you would be in a much better position to say, uh, I, I feel comfortable in spending marketing and sales dollars in order to generate more sales and create more revenue. And here, in order to calculate the customer acquisition cost, you have to calculate and figure out what your marketing and sales expenses are and be able to isolate those expenses specifically that relate to creating new customers. Okay, so if you're already in business and if you have marketing and sales processes in place, try to calculate how much money you're spending on both of those and do account for your own personal time if that's part of it. And come up with that number. If you come up with that number divided by the number of new customers that you generate based on those expenditures, that will give you a customer acquisition cost number. For instance, uh, we're giving a landscaping example here that we're using throughout this presentation. If you have a landscaping company, and let's say you spend $20,000 per year and generated 10 new clients, your customer, customer acquisition cost is $2,000. Make sense? That makes perfect sense. Now, as we move into number two here, the average revenue per customer, I love how these metrics, they build upon one another and then in the end, they all kind of come together and give us this total picture. So as, you, as we go through this, it, it's really a building block. Yes, and this second metric is the parallel of the customer acquisition cost. This one, it, again, is very important because what you want is your average revenue per customer to enable you to generate enough to cover your customer ac acquisition cost. So how do we calculate average revenue per customer? That's an easy one. You take your total revenue, uh, you divide it, uh, total revenue per year, you divide it by the number of customers that you have that will give you the average. Now, sometimes it may be better to calculate the, the norm as opposed to the average, uh, which is the center. So uh, what, what I would recommend is if you have different products and services in different categories, try to create the average revenue per customer metric for each of those. And if there are any mm -hmm. outliers, try to remove those outliers. So it gives you- a, a More accurate data. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so just to go back to that example of, uh, of um, the landscaping. So if, let's say that landscaping company generates $200,000 a year in revenue and uh, they have 130 clients, the average revenue per uh, customer is 1,500. Now, if, if that landscaping company, for instance, had, uh, was, was working for a, a big business or a homeowners association, uh, as one example, and then they have many individual homeowners that they work with. What you want to do is isolate the, the outlier, which is the homeowner association customer from the rest. So it doesn't skew that average in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Good word to the wise there. Yeah. And then the average customer lifespan, this is our third metric. Yeah. And here, what we're trying to point out is uh, that the customer, when you acquire them, they don't just stay with you and give you revenue for just once. Uh, typically, they come back. If your business is repetitive, like it is in, in the case of landscaping, what you want to try to do is figure out, on average, how long does a customer stay with you? And the way you do that is identify your churn rate, which is the percentage of business you're losing in one year, and then take one and divide it. Uh, by that churn rate. So for instance, if that landscaping company is losing 15% of its clients per year, 
the churn rate is one divided by 15%, which is roughly seven. So on average, a customer stays with that company about seven years. And that's an important uh, metric because it helps us identify that next metric that we, uh, we have on our slides here, uh, Paula, which is the customer lifetime value. Again, it's self-described it self what it is. The lifetime value of a customer is how much money a customer spends with you buying your product or service in their entire lifespan. So if that customer is staying for seven years and they're spending $1,500 per year, their customer lifetime value is about $10,000. Now, as we move forward to verify a customer acquisition cost, this is where things really start to unfold. And I, I love how this just, it gives such good data to make decisions. So go ahead. Yeah, so we, we wanna verify the customer acquisition cost to see if we're underspending or overspending. And there's a rule of thumb that you could apply here. So initially we calculated the customer acquisition cost for this landscaping company to be about $2,000. The rule of thumb that you could apply is, is um, take your uh, customer lifetime value, which we just calculated for this specific example at $10,000 and divide it by four. And then uh, when you do that, it comes out to be $2,500. So $2,000 compared to 2,500, $2, that's in the ballpark, right? So that kind of gives you an idea whether you're spending the appropriate amount of money to acquire new customers or if you're underspending or if you're overspending. Now, clients sometimes ask, Paula, why is it divided by four? And um, that varies based on the business or the service, the product. Mm -hmm. uh, but typically, the, the reason why we say divide by four, because we, we figure, you know, let's, let's spend that revenue that that client is generating for you. Let's spend a quarter of it to acquire that client. Let's spend a quarter of it to execute that service. Uh, the other quarter to cover the overhead costs involved in running a business, and then the last quarter as a profit to the business. Uh -huh. Now, depending again on the service and product, you may use a different rule of thumb here or different uh, denominator, but four tends to work pretty well for a lot of businesses. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And someone had asked to show the, the customer lifetime value again so they can figure out how that plays into this. I'm just gonna pop that slide back on for just a second before we move forward and um, and then move into, I, I really love uh, Peter Thiel's uh, model here. It helps to really understand, you know, how are you spending money? Where should you be spending money when it comes to marketing and sales? So we're gonna start using these metrics a little bit here. Yeah, so if you calculated your customer acquisition costs, you could compare it on this scale to what Peter Thiel is suggesting you do in terms of either marketing or sales expenditures. And um, most of our clients, uh, Paula, at SCORE, they fall in the uh, left side of that axis. So uh, mm -hmm. the, the, their customer acquisition costs are typically in the uh, couple of thousands and below. Sure. Uh, that's typically where small businesses operate. And uh, if, if your customer acquisition costs are in the, uh, in the single digits, like, you know, around a dollar to $10, then you have to really rely on viral marketing, networking effect in order to create your customer uh, following and, and your clientele. If, however, you have a higher customer acquisition cost that, that you could work with, around hundreds of dollars per customer, then you could spend a little bit more on marketing, potentially do some advertising on social media or pay-per-click or maybe display ads. Um, on the other side, it, obviously if you're a much larger corporation and you're working with governments and big businesses, you have the luxury and, and the ability to hire these uh, advanced salespeople that are gonna be uh, flying all over the world, potentially closing deals for you. Uh, but uh, a little further down, if, if your customer acquisition costs are around $10,000, then uh, potentially inside sales would be a good option where you could hire people, train them on following your sales process, and then uh, they could uh, walk uh, the customer through 
the journey uh, or, or the pr prospective customer through the buying journey uh, with uh, having um, interactions potentially online or via email or by phone or maybe over Zoom or even in person sometimes, particularly if you're working locally. The, the part in the middle is the tough part. That's the, the question mark part, which uh, Peter calls the dead zone, where it becomes very difficult to figure out what kind of marketing and sales mix you should have in order to sell your product. And many of our customers at SCORE struggle through that phase here because they're not sure whether they should invest more in marketing or whether they should hire a salesperson. And what I tell them typically is uh, don't hire a salesperson until you've generated enough sales leads to keep that salesperson busy on a full-time basis. Uh, so if you hire a salesperson and expect them to create the leads themselves, you're actually hiring a marketing person uh, or hiring a salesperson uh, or hiring a person paying them as a salesperson, making them work as a marketing person. So try to solve the marketing problem first, create the necessary leads. And if you have enough leads that are keeping you too busy and you can't keep up, then hire a salesperson and let them uh, follow through on these leads, but just make sure that you train them properly through that entire process we discussed earlier. Really good word to the wise there, Nabil, with the distinction between hiring a marketing person versus hiring a salesperson. I think a lot of folks do end up in that position where they hire a quote unquote salesperson and they're just doing marketing. That's all they're doing. There's not enough leads there to keep them busy. And I think that's a huge piece for, for delineation and really understanding this. Yeah. And there is a so difference between, there's a difference, a big difference between a marketing person and a salesperson. Um, and Skill set know, wise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So this is where hopefully everything comes together. Um, if, if you are one of those businesses who's looking at scaling your business and growing it exponentially, then what you have to do is calculate all these metrics that we just talked about. And, um, the, to determine how much revenue incrementally you want to add to your business. So for instance, let's, let's go to that. Let's go with that landscaping example. Let's say that landscaping business want to grow their business by 25%. And that's, that's, that's not considered linear. I mean, it may not be exponential, but that's, um, that's high growth. So 25%, that's basically 50,000, um, $50,000 additional that they have to create. Uh, the way you calculate what budget, what marketing and sales budget you need is by applying that equation. So what is your customer acquisition cost? You multiply it by the additional revenue that you, you think you want to create for your business and then divide it by the average revenue per customer. So in the landscaping example, 2,500 is uh, the customer acquisition cost. That's roughly what that company should spend. You multiply it by 50,000, that's how much we wanna grow the company, divided by $1,500, that's the average revenue per customer, that's per year. That gives us $83,000 uh, as a budget that that company has to invest. You know, this is such a, a diversion. I think it, it deviates from what people typically think about when they look at setting up their sales and marketing budget. And I think it's so much better in terms of giving us real quantitative information to go off of Nabil. I, I love this, this model so much. Yeah, and if, if we can go back, uh, Paul, yep. just a second. Sure. Uh, this is where a lot of small businesses struggle because uh, to them, it's like, why should I invest $83,000 to get $50,000 of additional business? It, it just doesn't make sense in the short term for them. And they may have cash flow issues where they, they cannot really bring in $83,000 uh, to the table in order to do this. Uh, the, the important point that I want to make here is that that $50,000 is for the first year. And as we calculated before, the average uh, lifespan of a, of a customer in this case. Seven years. Correct. Yeah. So in reality, that, that amount of marketing and sales expenditure is going to create $350,000 over seven years from these same people that, that you just added this year. And that's the part that's going to enable you over time to create that exponential growth. So um, you're going to have to have faith you're going to have to, to trust the processes that you put in place. You have to make sure that your processes are scalable. Uh, you have to make sure that the people that you bring in that are going to be able to scale your business are properly trained. 
to handle those processes and walk them step by step as they're supposed to. So there's a lot of proper execution that needs to take place before you achieve that scalable growth. But these are the metrics, the basic metrics that you have to apply and the processes that you have to put in place in order to achieve that exponential growth over time. Thanks for making that uh, delineation with the, the 300K plus um, revenue boost. I think that that's a, a huge piece here that folks don't look into. And there's other residuals too that I've found as I use these metrics on, on businesses that I've run. Yeah, there's something else that happens as you start to utilize this kind of system. And um, I don't know what it's, I call it the X factor where it ends up being even more than that. Um, and it's a matter of concentrating your money in the right places, I think. So let's talk about the lead conversion rate. Okay, a couple of more metrics that uh, I wanna discuss here so that you know about them and you keep track of them. Uh, your lead conversion rate is the rate at which you are converting leads to clients. So you figure out how many total new clients you were able to convert in a certain year. You divide it by the total number of leads that your marketing and sales activities generated during that year. That will give you your lead conversion rate. So in the case of a landscaping company, let's say they created 200 leads over the year and they were able only to convert 10. That's 5% lead conversion rate, meaning for every 20 leads, they get one customer. The and other the cost per lead, yeah. Yeah, the other uh, metric, and that is the cost per lead. It's important that you know roughly what that is because uh, it will help you better understand also how to budget and how to scale. Uh, so the cost per lead, you calculate that by your customer acquisition costs multiplied by your lead conversion rate. So if, if a customer, to acquire a customer costs you $2,500 and you're converting only 5%, your cost per lead is around $125. Yeah, so based on all these metrics, uh, obviously you could create some strategies uh, before we get into these questions. For instance, um, if, if, if indeed in this business, it's costing them between $2,000 and $2,500 to acquire a new customer. If you're a landscaping company, you could have a strategy where you could go in and knock on people's doors where you already have customers. You bring in customer testimonials with you and then offer them like major discounts for the first year. So let's say, let's say uh, a landscaper charges $150 a month uh, to cut the grass. If you offer somebody like 75 or 50% discount uh, the, uh, the first year on that, on that work, uh, your customer acquisition cost will be a lot less than what we just calculated. So there's, you could see based on those numbers, you could come up with many strategies that you could pursue in order to acquire clients at a much discounted rate initially, knowing long-term that you're going to be able to get that money back and a lot more over it. So uh, questions that you should ask yourself in, in the strategies that you're pursuing um, where, where does your CPL needs to be? Um, where uh, uh, are you accounting for both sales and marketing spending? You wanna make sure that uh, you're not leaving uh, something unaccounted for. You can't clone yourself for free. If you hire somebody to do what you're doing, you're gonna to have to pay them. So all these expenditures have to be accounted for. Uh, have you, uh, have you tried different lead generation methods uh, in order to figure out if uh, there's a way where uh, potentially you could create new channels so you could uh, grow faster and scale faster? Um, how about the quality of your leads? Are they consistently the same quality or are different channels generating different quality leads for you? So a lot of these questions uh, that we pre what present here on the slides need to be analyzed and addressed and your cost per lead has to be calculated pretty much for every one of those channels that you're trying to pursue to make sure that it is indeed a good channel for you to be working within. Yeah, that's such a great point, Nabil. And, and just in my experience, you know, paying for leads and understanding which channels are actually 
generating the highest quality leads that bring them through that initial, pro you know, where we talked about the process in the beginning, getting the, that client to the advocacy stage, you know, that's your end goal is to have that client move into advocacy. And when you look at your lead generation, your lead generation channels, which ones are bringing your clients quickly to that advocacy phase? That's the piece that you really want to be focusing your resources on. And I think that, you know, looking at that and understanding how those pieces are connected really helps you optimize your resources. It helps you understand where to spend your money because there may be a channel that's generating tons and tons of leads for you, but if your conversion to that advocacy piece is missing, then you're really not spending your money wisely. And I think that's a big piece a lot of folks don't spend a lot of time looking at. And a CRM can help you definitely in looking at that too, in terms of where your leads are coming from. CRM, as long as uh, you're entering in the data and keeping track of it, and you have the uh, definitely metrics uh, projected there, and, and uh, you, you make sure that uh, I mean your 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 results are going to be as good as all the inputs that you put in. So just make sure that you're uh, diligent about doing all that throughout that entire process. Yeah, that's such a great point too. You know, you can have the best CRM system, but if you're not actually tracking the the data, the information there, uh, it's not really going to do you a ton of good. So uh, definitely be utilizing that for sure. Um, any other questions? Anything else that you wanted to add here, Nabil, in terms of um, resources or words to the wise for folks around the metrics piece? Yeah, I mean, we're barely scratching the surface here, the surface here with, with metrics. There's definitely a lot of additional metrics that you could track. I mean, if you look at Google Analytics or Search Console or try to use any of the other metrics that are available on social media, uh, you could get lost with that. And there's so much, there's so much that we're keeping track of nowadays. It's not just a matter of keeping track track of the data is knowing what data to look at, what data to analyze, and making the right decisions out of that data. So it's very important that at least you start with this foundation that we just discussed here. If it's, if it's uh, enough for you to create your KPIs, your key performance indicators, that's great. If it's not enough, try to develop it, try to streamline it, try to optimize it, create additional metrics as needed. Just make sure that you have what you need in order to understand where your business is, how it is growing, how you could grow even further and um, set the proper goals and the proper budgets in order to achieve your goals. Yeah, that's so important. And I think, um, you know, as you look at the tools that are out there, you said it in the beginning of the workshop is that, you know, we are living in a data rich environment and to optimize the use of that data and implement that into the decision-making process in terms of how we're spending money, that's a major shift for a lot of folks. You know, it's one thing to have all this data and it's there and, and just out there, but to actually harness that and utilize it to drive decision-making for your business, that's when it becomes a really rich tool for you to implement and utilize with the business. And if you have further questions, if you want to dive into this, you know, we do have the mentoring through SCORE Minnesota. Um, and you can develop your own marketing and sales process with that SCORE mentor. We're happy to help you with that um, and create a scalable and successful business for you. You can just jump onto our website, score, uh, minnesota.score.org and uh, we'll be able to provide you with that information. We do wanna thank you folks for joining us today and taking the time to think about your business in a new way. And hopefully you'll be getting onto the site and, and joining us in further workshops or getting yourself a mentor and really taking this to the next level. Paul, I do wanna mention that um, we will be following up and sending these slides to everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. The recording will be available for everybody to see it if they want to. Also, there will be a spreadsheet link. Uh, I know many of our SCORE clients are, are allergic to numbers and <laughs> well, like to deal with so the spreadsheet will have all the equations and all you have to do is just put in the numbers uh, of basically how many leads you're generating and how many customers you have and and it will figure out all these metrics for you hopefully that will be helpful and if there are any questions uh, please get in touch with us uh, you have our information on our website minnesota.score.org we're all here and 
And thank you, Nabil, for taking the time to present this information and, and getting folks this information, because I think it's something that's really a great starter kit um, for folks that are really looking at growing their business. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Take care now. All right. Bye-bye.